Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. us, God who once walked among us, and God who spurs us ever on. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the last Sunday in our liturgical year, which is also the newest feast in our liturgical calendar, the Feast of Christ the King, or the Reign of Christ as some denominations call it. It explains why the gospel puts us in the midst of Good Friday, even though it's November. Pope Pius XI introduced this feast in 1925 to mark the 1600th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. Europe was recovering from a war more devastating than anyone could have imagined. At that time, the world was longing for a different kind of king, a different kind of ruler, a different kind of kingdom. In our time, we've seen too many die from COVID, too many die from gun violence, and leaders who have too hard a time working cooperatively for good. We too long for a different kind of kingdom. At the time Jesus lived on this earth, the world was also looking for a different kind of king, a different kind of ruler, a different kind of kingdom. The Roman Empire had overtaken Palestine and was occupying the Holy Land. We find reminders throughout the Gospel accounts of Jesus' life that he was born that different kind of king, one who came to serve, not to be served, one who came to give his life for others, not one who amassed wealth and territory and power at the expense of others one whose reign was about love and freedom and forgiveness and inclusion, not about fraud or deception or tyranny or force. The visit of the Magi and their royal gifts remind us the baby was born a king. The jealous response of King Herod to the news of his birth signals he felt threatened by this new king. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey announced his kingship. At his trial, he answers Pilate's question, are you the king of the Jews? In the affirmative, but notes his kingdom isn't of this world. It's different. Pilate ordered an inscription be placed on Jesus' cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. When I ponder that different kind of kingdom, I'm reminded of the beautiful prayer for peace from our prayer book. It's one read at our national cathedral when they pause every hour, every day to pray for peace. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit 
that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory, now and forever. That's the kind of kingdom I want to live in. That's the kind of kingdom I want to be part of, I want to work for. This year's Gospel reading features the exchange between Pilate and Jesus as he stands trial. John gives us so much more detail than do Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus is on trial for insurrection, a term we've sadly become more familiar with this year. Jesus has claimed the title King of the Jews. Since there's only one position of power in the empire, this claim is treasonous. It's the Jewish religious authorities who are upset by Jesus' claim of kingship because it threatened their power and their positions. But they weren't allowed to sentence anyone to death by crucifixion. Only the Roman government could do that. So if we read around today's passage a little before and a little after, we notice that Pilate, who represents the Roman government, keeps going back and forth as if he's nervously pacing. He goes inside his headquarters to talk with Jesus and then outside to talk with the religious authorities and the crowd. It's hard to miss the irony that the Jewish authorities won't go inside because they want to keep themselves ritually clean in order to celebrate the upcoming Passover. They don't want to be ritually unclean, but they're plotting to have a man put to death. I find my focus drawn to Pilate. It seems to me he's really wrestling with the job the religious authorities have put on him. He doesn't seem to want to condemn Jesus to death. Matthew tells us in his account that troubled by a dream she had, Pilate's wife begged him to have nothing to do with Jesus' death. Dreams are a way God communicates with us. We see that especially in Matthew's Gospel. And I so wish we knew more about Pilate's wife and her dream. But that's all we know. After interrogating Jesus, Pilate tells the Jewish authorities, I find no case with him. It's the custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. How about I release Jesus? Not Jesus, the crowd roars. Give us Barabbas. While the Synoptic Gospels tell us Barabbas was an insurrectionist, John tells us he was a bandit. We're reminded of the good shepherd who's willing to lay down his life to protect his sheep from the bandit. What really intrigues me about the exchange between Pilate and Jesus is Pilate's curiosity. He seems open to knowing more about Jesus. It seems he wants to know on a personal level whether Jesus is king. Jesus tells him he is, but that he's a different kind of king. He doesn't make use of force to save himself from death or for anything else. He's come to testify to truth, truth about God, God who's all about love and forgiveness. What is truth, Pilate asks. I hear in that question a desire to know more about Jesus, to know more about what he stands for. It seems Pilate comes this close to turning his life around, to letting Jesus go free, to becoming one of his followers. Jesus teaches us a lesson in this exchange. We remember Pilate is the enemy. He's the governor enforcing Roman occupation and rule on the Jewish people. He has the power to sentence Jesus to death by crucifixion. And yet, Jesus is, is willing to engage with him. I hear invitation in Jesus' question to him. Do you ask about me on your own or because what others have told you about me? Jesus is open to welcoming Pilate into his fold. What a model of love and forgiveness and inclusion. What an example of life in God's kingdom and how people treat each other there. Dean, you are here today and we're so glad you are because others have told you about Jesus. Others, your parents and your godparents, will make promises in your name today that you will follow Jesus and his teachings and you will tell us about them. 
and we, your church family, will promise to support you as you do that. We look forward to watching you grow in this community as we share what we know of Jesus with you and you begin to share what you know of him with us as you're already beginning to do. <laughs> Our prayer for you is that the day will come when you will know Jesus not just by what we've told you, but on your own terms, based on your experience of God at work in your life, based on your own personal and unique relationship with God. Dean, you're so very lucky that your parents have chosen Holy Comforter as the church that will have a hand in your faith formation. This faith community offers so many opportunities for us to get to know Jesus for ourselves, to develop what Episcopal priest and theologian John Westerhoff called owned faith, a stage of faith development that allows us to answer Jesus' question, I do know you on my own, and not just from what others have told me about you. This owned faith is not the faith we happen to learn from our parents. It's not the faith handed down to us by our denomination, though both of those are important building blocks for growing into our own faith. Each of us at Holy Comforter has found an offering, or several or multiple, that invites us to wrestle with coming to know Jesus on our own. Where have you found those building blocks to your faith? Has it been through engaging in scripture, in Bible study, or Christian formation classes? Has it been through a mission opportunity where you've been able to see and to serve the Christ and others? Has it been through offering your gifts to enhance our worship of God by singing, reading, preparing the altar, or keeping us clergy straight as the acolytes and vergers do? Perhaps it's been in the youth group or the confirmation class where questions are welcomed. Or maybe it's been volunteering at our thrift shop Pennywise where the community and the parish are served and fellowship is a side benefit. There are so many rich opportunities to choose from. As we continue our focus on stewardship, we remember these ministries need us in order to continue. They need our participation and our leadership and they need our financial support as well. As we prayerfully consider where we'll invest our gifts of time and talent and treasure, we remember Jesus asks each one of us, do you know me only based on what others tell you? Or do you know me? Amen.